And, as, as, <laughs> and unfortunately, it's been laid upon me by both Forrest and, and some, some other libertarians here to, to uh, take on the role of Messiah or prophet <laughs> tonight and point the way out of a gathering loom, <laughs> which has been... Uh, <laughs> I don't think um, I'm not going to try to make it my mission to convert people to optimism tonight, uh, <laughs> or to point the way out. I'm going to just try to explain uh, <clears throat> why I'm optimistic, and maybe that maybe some of this will rub off. Um, it's also it's a peculiar thing for me because it's it's in so many ways, both a factually and an analysis of the present system. Thanks, thanks a lot. Except I'm very close to the forest, and other and other ways we're far apart, and it's and it's uh, it's a peculiar kind of symbiotic relationship. At any rate, <coughs> um, I'm uh, I'm not the, the reason. Well, let me, let me start this way. And the reason I'm why I'm not worried about the uh, Bill Marina's uh, confusion confusion f- freezing, which is I guess similar to the way the forest uh, analysis <coughs> is. Uh, I think. <coughs> I mean, it's been true that throughout history, as, as, as Forrest said this morning, uh, despotism, statism, caste system, etc., has been the norm <coughs> in civilizations. Uh, what, uh, how, it, how, how they got that way is something <coughs> which I don't know that much about. I think I have read a little bit about ancient Sumeria, the first great civilization, and according to uh, Samuel Kramer, the, the great Sumerologist, uh, Sumer, Sumerian civilization started as a free market kind of uh, situation, free society, free market kind of orientation, and then, then the then the uh, society freezes up, and uh, apparently the from what you can get out of the literature, obviously we don't know that much about specific processes of ancient civilization. Apparently, what happens is that uh, the defense, the, the the voluntary defense agency, which happened to be also the temple, which was built on the Top of a hill in ancient Sumeria. Uh, it was a sort of a combination, of like vertical integration or horizontal integration, whatever you call it. The temple was also the fort. So when the older, when the tribes came mar- marauding in from a, from outside Sumeria, so everybody would take refuge in the temple, and, they, and the and the temple organization, the priests, would also perform the, mil- uh, the military defense function. <coughs> Apparently, as the centuries continued, there's more and more problem from marauding tribes, and the temple began to become a permanent military garrison state kind of situation, exacting taxes, etc., etc., and, we, and we're into the state. At any rate, this, <clears throat> maybe that's one model of how, of how uh, Oriental despotism originates. But at any, any rate, they certainly tend to freeze in, and they, can, they tend to continue on for a long, long time. Uh, what causes them to degenerate, to disintegrate? Well, it could be many reasons. It could be because the uh, Roman Empire perhaps overtaxed itself, overtaxed the subjects, and uh, <clears throat> and new tribes come moving in, or perhaps climatic changes. Apparently, many ancient civilizations were going along very nicely until suddenly, bingo, the the, the rain disappears or whatever, and they've had it. At any rate, uh, it seems to me that the it's true, that, and it's true that Western civilization over the last several hundred years uh, is a great burst of of free society or free market and so forth and, and individual liberty uh, but it's <clears throat> I think this is not a cause for pessimism I, I, one could easily be, be, be pessimistic just on that score say well looking looking at the history of the human race uh, libertarian and free market and prosperity in general uh, standard high standard living etc is really only a, a, a sort of a pimple on the, on the human in this, in the history however I think uh, I think there's a, a, quanti- a qualitative change has occurred, uh, <clears throat> which makes which makes which which makes the uh, Confucian model, so to speak, you know, obsolescent. In other words, which which leads to a uh, epistemological or historiographical optimism. And the quantum change basically is the industrial revolution. Let me let me, let me put it this way: uh, the the model, the paradigm we can we can look at, uh, Oriental despotism, let's say. Uh, you have the peasants, uh, essentially agricultural society, of course. Uh, you have the peasants who are down there sweating down on the rice paddies or the wheat fields or whatever, and they're, and they're uh, overseen and supervised by a, a giant bureaucracy with the king at the top. And the bureaucracy, the power elite, extracts the, the, uh, everything above subsistence from the peasants, shoots it up to the top and creates this, this, uh, this uh, 
the power elite, uh, wealth and, and, and civilization, and gold and you know, you know, Damask or whatever, uh, tapestry, and all the stuff that we, we, we see in the movies, you know, about the, about the ancient empires. And down there is the galley slaves and the, and the presidents uh, dying at the age of 20 and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> well, that, well, this sort of system, which we can call oriental despotism, is a monstrous, uh, evil, horrible system from a libertarian point of view. Uh, however, it can, it, it's viable in the sense that it can continue on indefinitely. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no mechanism in the system to necessarily lead to its overthrow. <clears throat> so I think uh, if, I, if I were around, if any libertarian was around in ancient China, we could be pretty, you know, it would be legitimate to be fairly pessimistic about the chances for, <laughs> for changing society and so forth, and one might well look for forests, you know, escape hatch, down the Yangtze or wherever and uh, get, get out. <laughs> but, but I think, um, <laughs> I think what it, it seems, uh, it's, in my view, is a, a fantastic qualitative change occurs with the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> um, and the really ma amazing thing are the guys who made the Industrial Revolution. In other words, the 17th and 18th century classical liberals, uh, they didn't have nearly as cause to be as optimistic as we do. And the fact that they were optimistic and felt that they could they could bust through the mercantilist and, and guild system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, <clears throat> was high testimony to their to their uh, courage and faith, faith in their in what they could accomplish. Okay, we get the Industrial Revolution, which starts around mid 18th century, <clears throat> continues on approximately to the mid 19th, is the first great burst. And with this, we have a, a complete change in the viability of social systems. Because we have the irreversi irreversibility of, te of technology, of industrial, the industrial system developing, of an incre a fantastically increased standard of living for the masses. Not so much for the guys on top. The king is, you know, more or less the king pegged along pretty well in the old days before the industrial revolution. So it's the mass of the population you know, has clothes to wear and a, a place to eat that's not in the same room with the pigs and that sort of stuff. It's true. The, the, the masses of the, you know, the peasants from the former industrial revolution were living in one room hut with the, with the pigs. At any rate, so you have this enormous, enormous quantum change, a qualitative change in, in, in conditions, and you have also what's, uh, it's called the unfortunate name, the revolution of rising expectations. But what it really means is nobody's now going to settle. Nobody's going to settle for the old pre-industrial kind of system. So that every social group, uh, with the possible exception of the the current anti-technology crazies, but I don't really take them very seriously. Like they, they always go off to the to the woods with a you know with a hi-fi set and so forth uh, under their arms. So uh, uh, all, well, whichever camp you're talking about, whether it's right wing, left wing, communist, new left, etc., etc., across the board, every group is committed, ideologically committed, and personally committed to continuing an industrial system, to continuing a a high standard of living for the masses, or a fairly high standard of living for the masses, and to, to make it, you know, and, to, and, and after all, we have this enormous population which we couldn't have had in a pre-industrial system. In a, in a pre-industrial system, uh, if, if we went back to the to the land and the, and the communes and all that sort of stuff, and scrap technology, maybe a couple of people would be left, but 99% of the pop world population would die off. So we're locked in to a irreversible uh, technological industrial commitment to technological industrial revolution. Well, given that, given this, well, there is our sort of free will choice in that sense, where we choose, everybody, I think every, every group <coughs> chooses, uh, or hopes to, 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 a, to continue an industrial system, and to even expand it. Uh, the Marxists, for example, as utopian and kooky as they are, <coughs> are committed also to expanding industrialism until the point where we have a Garden of Eden and there's no, and there's no scarcity. Of course, they're not going to have that. The point is that they, they too are committed to an expanding industrial uh, system. Given that commitment, which I think is almost universal, then uh, the only possible system which could make this, which could maintain and make an industrial system viable is the free market and free society. In other words, basically libertarian, uh, libertarian world. So the libertarianism becomes not only moral, uh, not only <coughs> the, the best thing from, from, a, from, a, from a, I consider a moral principle point of view, it also becomes the only viable system uh, to, to maintain the, the, the society and civilization and, and the standard of living and, and, and even pure survival for most of the populace. So in other words, with the Industrial Revolution, we have a fusion of moral principle and necessity, so to speak. 
both of which are now geared into the libertarian uh, matrix. So <coughs> if, we, if we say that then, and this means that all that we have to do, well, we, well I wouldn't say all we have to do, but, one of, but it makes the ta libertarian task much easier because it means that to convince the, the, the public, the general public, or most of the public, or the thinking public, or whatever you want to call them, <coughs> opinion molders, effective, effective num um, number of people to, to effect social change, all you really have to do, <coughs> for this, at least in this basic sense, is to show them that you, that, that, that you have to have free market and you have to have uh, a libertarian system to, to, to have the whole, uh, the whole society and the whole civilization continue to be viable. So you don't have to necessarily convince them of every detail of every moral principle, but, but you can show them that if you want to survive, if you want the, the, the country to survive or the world to survive, you have to go over to a libertarian free market setup. <coughs> now this, I think, would be, is a powerful argument once the person is really convinced of this. And of course, the real question is, <coughs> uh, why should they be, not so much why should they be convinced of it, but why should they be interested in the whole topic? Although it's, it would seem to me to be an interesting topic, whether the world is going to survive or not. But that people have people have other interests, <laughs> and it's something that's sort of like you know, you have to slap a kid's face or something to focus his attention on what you want to tell him. There's the there's the there's a societal need for a bit of <laughs> a bit of attention getting <laughs> to to focus his attention on, and then we'll get, I'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> Necessity for attention calling. Uh, so, about the first people uh, to, to, re to, to, to realize this, and I think brilliant social philosophers who have almost been completely neglected uh, among historians and uh, social philosophers in general, because they were the first guys to see that industrialism made a big difference. In other words, the, the, uh, it's all well and good to be a libertarian. I don't denigrate the, 18th, the early you know, Enlightenment li li type of libertarians, but they were not dealing with industrial system. And they didn't see that industrialism brings in this ex extra argument for epistemological dash historiographical optimism. Now, the first guy to really see this, uh, I don't know who the first one was, but the, one of the first people was Jean-Baptiste Say, the great French economist, and his successor, uh, whom, for whom I, I shouldn't be talking about this at all, because Leonard is a great expert on these two people, uh, Charles Dunoyer and Charles Comte. Charles Comte has no relation, either ideological or personal, to Auguste Comte, the uh, the screwball takes over later. Uh, Charles Comte, uh, Charles Comte, and Charles, <laughs> Charles Comte and Charles Dunoyer. As far as I know, the <laughs> as far as I know, Charles Comte and Charles Dunoyer have only been even mentioned by Eli Halevi in his very interesting work, *The Era of Tyrannies*, and uh, and Andreski uh, uh, in passing. At least in English. But anyway, these are some of the first people to focus in on this, on this whole question. Industrialism, if you're committed to industrial society and committed to industrial revolution, you have to have liberty. Even, even if you might not have to have it before, they weren't really interested in whether you had to have liberty before the industrial revolution. Uh, you certainly need it now, is essentially their point. And they began to describe, analyze why this was true. They analyzed it largely from the economic point of view and also from the soci sociological point of view. Uh, and they were observing, of course, England being industrialized and France being industrialized, and they were thinking about that very seriously and in, in, in great depth. Uh, and they come up with uh, heralding doomsday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not be a spiritual oil theorist now. <laughs> okay, the, uh, <laughs> so what they did, when they began to analyze very deeply the whole, what happened? What was the essence of the pre-industrial system? What was the essence of the industrial system? What, what difference does the whole thing make? What was really been happening? And it was, it was called the Nunway and Say, and, uh, who originated what later came to be called class analysis. Uh, now, of course, we think in our present benighted age, we think of class analysis as being Marxist, commie. Uh, it was not originally Marxist or commie, it was originally libertarian. Not only was it libertarian, it was a key element of the libertarian ruling bloc. Essentially, what they said was that, um, and certainly even John Stuart Mill heralded these people. John Stuart Mill, I must admit, even though I'm not very congenial to his general temperament, 
that acknowledge a lot of these people who, are, who remain obs un unjustly obscure. Uh, they saw that they looked at the past epoch. It was a pre-industrial epoch. What did they see? They saw essentially what you read in the Albert J. Nock book. They saw class domination. In other words, they saw a ruling class. <coughs> Uh, and the analysis basically goes something like this. In Oriental despotism, you have the bureaucracy and the king on top, the emperor on top, is, constitutes the ruling class, peasants subjected underneath. Huh? <laughs> what picnic? <laughs> and in a feudal society, you have the, the Landlords have come in as a, as, a, as a ruling group and carved out different, uh, decent, more decentralized areas of, of rule. Uh, so you have this, this concept of the ruling class as being, as being the rulers. Now, I, here, I, of course, one of, one of my major epistemological dash historiographical differences with Forrest is I don't think, I think there is a them, and uh, there is a ruling class at any given period, and they, they can be identified by historical or contemporary investigation. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the problems is <laughs> Okay. Now my gold ring is left like a can you <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see, what was I saying now? Uh, class ruler. Right, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, one of the differences here is that I, I, I'm a methodological individualist, meaning there ain't no such thing when you get right down to it as institutions or collectives or groups or societies or nations. That they're all only individual people. Of course, these individual people have played different roles and act as if they are, they are collective things. And when dealing in, in common sense terminology, it's, it's helpful to use these uh, collective nouns as metaphors. But when you really get down to it, there are only individuals, only individuals who will act, think, and so forth, and choose, and so and etc. So, uh, of course, these individuals interact all the time. <coughs> Nobody denies that. There's never been incidentally individualism has been smeared, of course, through history. And individualists are always, are always said to have believe that every individual is atomistic. It's the famous term, atomistic individualism. Every individual thinks that every individual is, every, is an atom sort of riding around in a vacuum and having no contact with anybody else. That, of course, no individual, even, Max, even the, the crazed Max Stoner, has really ever held that. <laughs> so, so uh, it was the most extreme individual of all. Of, of all. So, uh, <clears throat> every individual is recognized, of course, individuals interact and learn from each other and affect each other and so forth and so on. But the point is that there are, when you get that right down to it, only individuals and only they are around. So therefore, if this is true, that some individuals are getting a net out of any system, and if there is a ruling class, and any state's kind of set up, some individuals are getting, getting a net balance advantage out of, this, out of this state process, and others are on the losing end. Now, one of the great, one of the uh, best political philosophers on this whole topic by the way, John C. Calhoun, I recommend his, his disquisition on government. Outside, of course, unfortunately, Calhoun happened to come from South Carolina, so he was a little wrapped up on the slave question and deviated from libertarianism a, a, bit, a bit on that. <laughs> when you get him off the slave question, he was a brilliant libertarian thinker. One of the things he said, he said more than 30 pages than most political scientists saying about 8,000. And one of the things he said there is any, <clears throat> given any state at all, even the most minimal functions and the most minimal form, uh, degree of taxation, even the teeniest state in the world, you still have immediate, immediately a state, the very existence of a state generates class conflict. Now, how does it generate? Even, even if they, the state wants to be very libertarian, confine itself to the night watchman role and all that. Why is that? Because the very existence of taxes means that one set of the population is paying the taxes on net, the other set of population is, is what Calhoun in a brilliant terminology called consuming the taxes. So you have the net taxpayers on the one hand, and the net tax consumers on the other. And of course, some of these net tax consumers are kicking back a little bit into the till and, and, and so forth. The point is, on net, <coughs> they are just, just praxeologically, so to speak, just, just looking at it, just pure arithmetic. If, if one group is paying taxes on balance, somebody else is getting it. So 
Therefore, the existence of any state at all sets up class conflict. And the more power you give to the state, and the more functions the state takes on, the greater, more intense, the more aggravated the class conflict becomes, because you're fighting over a bigger share of the loot, bigger amount of loot to begin with. Uh, take, for example, a bureaucrat. Uh, the bureaucrat receives, you know, gets a twenty thousand dollars salary. Let's say so he's working for his assistant, assistant commissioner in charge of stamping uh, signature or whatever. Uh, and he pays taxes, supposedly like everybody else. See, the fiction is maintained that he pays taxes, that he kicks in 5000 or whatever to, to the Internal Revenue Service. Actually, of course, he doesn't pay any taxes at all. He's getting $15,000 tax-free out of the system. The, the, the fiction that he pays taxes is a purely accounting device, but his entire income is derived from taxes. <coughs> so, <coughs> so the very existence of a state set up, sets up this tax consumption, tax consumer versus taxpayer thing. And then, of course, when the state starts doing anything beyond the pure a police function, it immediately sets up some more class conflict, more subsidies, and more, and more privileges, and so forth and so on. So in any, in any society, my view is in any society, you have identifiable uh, net tax gainers and net tax consumers. Some of them, of course, very big net tax consumers. Others are somewhere on the margin. And you have an identifiable, therefore, power elite or ruling class, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> um, the, uh, I think Brezhnev and Kosygin, whoever else is that, I've really forgotten their names because they don't have the color, the color, colorfulness of Kushi in the old in the old days. They're sort of lost touch with the Kremlin. But uh, I mean, they're, you know, they're the top of the ruling class in, in Russia, and there are others. You sort of cut, you can cut the thing off somewhere in the upper bureaucracy. Uh, <coughs> okay, so the, but but the, the original ruling class analysis of Dunoyer, Comte, and 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 Say, etc. The libertarian ruling class analysis identify the ruling class as those people, whatever groups they happen to be, whether they're merchants, landlords, oriental despots, bureaucrats, or whatever, who have seized control of the state apparatus and are ruling the rest, ruling the rest of the society through taxation. Um, now this this is a, this this definition of class, a ruling class, was a very precise one, and there was no problem with it. <clears throat> In other words, the, the class of the, the ruling class of the guys who got control of the state. Uh, this, this is a quote, uh, the later words, not in the same context, a much more confused social theorist, Socolus Jerry Simpson, uh, later in the late 19th century. <laughs> Socolus Jerry, I would not endorse Socolus Jerry's social analysis, he, was a little, he didn't have theoreticians of great merit to advise him. But when he said, there were two, he said one time, there were two classes of people, two, uh, said Socolus Jerry, the robbers and the robbed. And that's essentially, that's sort of, you know, that's the nub of the thing. And notice the difference between this and the Marxian class analysis. Let me show that in a minute. Uh, well, what happens by various... Well, uh, oh, another thing. So, Comte and Dunoyer also say that uh, industrialism requires a free market, that free market uh, established conditions for industrialization, and the industrial system can only be maintained by continuing a free market, and, that, and went through the whole analysis and predicted that if this free market principle is, continues and expands as it should, we will eventually get to, a, to what they call a classless society. What they meant by a classless society was a society without a ruling class, not a society without differences, and without specialization, without division of labor, but a society without a ruling class in which, uh, quote, a government of men will be replaced by the administration of things. This is supposed to be a quote from Karl Marx. It's not a quote from Karl Marx. It's a quote from our great libertarian theorists. What they meant by that was that, was that, <coughs> that the, the government will wither away because it's obviously unviable, and as it's demonstrated to be more and more unviable, uh, that will wither away and the market will replace it. <coughs> um, they also had another great quote, which I forgot, but in, in a similar line, another great Marxian, supposedly Marxian quote, is, is the Comte Dunoyer analysis of what will happen in the future libertarian society. <coughs> okay, so they set this up, and also the thing is that the, it, we, we begin to have this, this distinction, uh, the, the great ideological party distinction, so to speak, in the early 19th century, is essentially, and of course it's oversimplified, but we've gotten to the stage, the last day is always the day of over oversimplifications, we want to cut through to the truth, uh, is essentially what we have is the, the so-called party of the left, uh, to, to, to be the party of the left is us, and this, this, is my, this is my view, the party of the left is essentially libertarians, quasi-libertarians, minimal government, as what a friend of mine calls minarchists, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so forth. And these people were essentially interested. They wanted to press on to a free market, freer and freer market. And along with the free market comes comes individual liberty, 
separation of church and state, uh, international peace, free trade, hard money, etc., etc., the whole business, the whole quasi-libertarian setup. That's the, that's the so-called left, or later, later, later to be known as classical liberals or classical radicals. Now, on the right, <coughs> the bad guys, the enemy, were the conservatives, <coughs> the capital C, defenders of the old order, of the of throne and altar, of a fixed caste, of, uh, of uh, what I've mentioned before about uh, intellectuals as bodyguards of, of, the, of, the, ruling class, of the ruling class, etc. Uh, international warfare, high tariffs, uh, fixed nobility, and so forth and so on. The whole, the, the, what we can call the old order, the capital O, capital O. And uh, the, the, the classical liberals were the revolutionaries in the widest sense who were, who were smashing the old order from within and from without and by, by various methods, sometimes violent, sometimes peaceful, depending on the situation. But the, the conservatives uh, really developed conservatism as a, as a reaction to the, to the revolution, quotes, of the late 18th, early 19th century. And so originally conservatism, um, as an rea explicitly reactionary attempt, to smash the, this new upstart and go back to the old order. And Bonal and the Mestre and all these, all these characters, essentially what, what they want to do is this end the American, French, and industrial revolutions and go back to the good old days of the of throne and altar. Uh, what happens, the, the, I, it seems to me, my, my general interpretation of what happens later on with conservatism and also with, with the center, uh, the, 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 the vital center, what happens is that they begin to realize that the, the right wing, in quotes, of that period, the classical rightists, put it that way, begin to realize that the jig is up. They, they ain't going to restore the, 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 you know, the, the old order. They're not going to get absolute monarchy back in the same form, because now we have industrialization to cope with. And you can't really say you've got to smash industry. I mean, they try to do it. And the Factory Acts, for example, in England, were attempt by the Tory landlords to try to cripple the uh, industrialists who are competing for the, for the labor supply. They want to keep, keep paying very low wages to the, to the guys on the farms. They didn't like the people rush, racing off and getting higher wage jobs in industry. But, but these things were basically, they, they had to realize, they realized that they had to transmute old-fashioned conservatives into some kind of new guys and accept this kind of new system, uh, at least appear to accept the new system, accept in industrialization and accept, um, and accept the... Um, democracy in some sense. The voting, democracy originally was a libertarian kind of weapon. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a weapon to get, to at least have some say in, in a, a situation along with the nobles, the king, and so forth. Uh, okay, in this, in this situation, uh, classical liberalism is making sweeping victories all across the board. Sweeping victories not only because it's a mass, mo it's a mass movement, it's a movement designed to, to telling the masses, we, this is going to give you liberty and, and and a higher standard of living and mobility and so forth and so on, an opportunity to break out of the caste and all the rest. And uh, it's obviously working very well. <coughs> I mean, it's paying off its promises pretty quickly. <coughs> and old-fashioned conservatism is getting more and more discredited. Now, something happens around the, around the mid-19th century. Several things begin to happen. <coughs> uh, one of the things that begins, I, I mentioned about war, the classical liberalism hives off and becomes super patriotic and goes off on war adventures. Another thing that happens is that conservatism pops up again in a curious new guise uh, known as socialism. And socialism is a very new kind of thing. It's one of the newest classical liberalism and classical socialism about the newest political philosophies. Uh, and I guess anarchism also. These, th these things are all new with, 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 basically in the 19th, early 19th century. And, um, and socialism is even newer. Newer, of course, than liberalism. And, uh, <coughs> and socialism appeals to a lot of people for various reasons. One, it's, 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 it has a new utopian thing, which really hasn't happened before, uh, been advanced before on any kind of large scale, which is we're going to bring, we're going to bring a second revolution. It's okay to have a liberal revolution, uh, you know, industrial revolution against the old order, and we're going to come to fulfill the promise of the old liberal revolution. We're going to bring in a new socialist revolution, which is going to bring everybody not only abundance, not only industrialism, which, they, which they're going to keep. I mean, they're frankly now saying, okay, we're going to keep industrialism, etc. But we're also bringing you something else, which is equality, uniformity, uh, the, the end of specialization, the vision of labor, and so forth, all these cookie utopian goals. So we have this very peculiar blend of situation where the socialists are using to, to, to try to achieve classical liberal goals, such as peace, classless society, uh, 
the liquidation of the, of, the, of the government of men into the administration of things, uh, industrialization, uh, abundance, high standard of living for the masses, etc., and freedom, or in quotes, they, the, the socialists proposed to achieve this by conser old-fashioned conservative means. It's a very peculiar kind of hybrid. Because in other words, okay, we, they say we accept classical liberal goals, they're right. But we're, we're going to bring you these goals, uh, and while bringing back the good old conservative sense of belonging, as it's now called, community, uh, um, caste kind of system, uh, collective collectivization, statism from the top, and so forth and so on. So we have, so socialism begins as a, as a hybrid, peculiar hybrid movement with a grave inner contradiction in it, which only becomes really evident later. Now what happens in the, in the Comte, on the Comte Dunoyer front is that uh, Comte, one of Comte Dunoyer's disciples during their uh, high period, their high period was shortly after the Napoleon, uh, the restoration uh, period after Napoleon is beaten, uh, one, of their, one of their disciples is some of a nutty old guy named Saint-Simon, who was sort of hanging around salons. And uh, as far as I remember <laughs> reading, reading uh, Leonard's material, Saint-Simon never read anything, just sort of listened, you know, to, to parlor gossip. <laughs> so uh, so he, was a, he was a libertarian at that point. He was a free market libertarian. And then he, after some years, he breaks, he sort of drifts away from the Comte de Noyer circle and becomes sort of some, some, something of a socialist. It's, it's not very well known what he actually became because he didn't really write much. And the St. Simonians who follow him were sort of much more socialistic than Saint Simon. But anyway, it's through, it's through the fuzzy and confused mind of Saint Simon that the, the, that the libertarian class analysis filters down to the St. Simonians who codify the whole thing and put it down around 1830. And, um, and the St. Simonians transmute by this whole process that's filtering through the fuzzy mind of Saint Simon. The, the Saint Simon has changed the whole class analysis and make it really completely self-contradictory, but make it somehow more, more uh, uh, saleable. And the, the Saint Simonian class analysis now becomes this: Okay, we we we, we acknowledge that the ruling class back in the feudal period, the despot, around the despotic period, was you know, who you said it was. But now, when you get to the free market, when you get to classical liberalism, suddenly a new ruling class pops up, which has no relation to the state whatsoever. That's the employers, the, the you know, businessmen, employers of labor. So all of a sudden you have another, the employer class is a ruling class over the workers by very virtue of the fact that the employers are paying workers for their serv labor services. So in other words, what the Marxist-Leninist um, theory of class is a, is a completely confused, self-contradictory amalgam of the old libertarian theory of the ruling class, which is who, he who controls the state or that group which controls the state, blended in to you know, the whole thing shifting completely when you get to the employer-employee relationship, but suddenly the employer, just by virtue of paying the worker for his services becomes a ruler over him. And this is all mixed in, everything you know, follows them to the Marxian class theory. And then Marx, Karl Marx himself picks up the St. Simonian theory of class, and we're off to the races. And, we com and this is combined, and also the, the concepts, such as administration of, the government of men will be replaced by administration of things, these, and the classless society, these things, these things which were eventually, originally liber strictly libertarian concepts, now become, excuse me, left-wing utopian concepts in the sense that now they become, well, first we're going to take over the state, the working class will take over the state, but the working class is also oppressed, and then we'll smash everything, we'll, we'll eventually wind up with a classless society, meaning no, no, no division of labor, no specialization, everybody uh, uniform, and, uh, and no scarcity, and the, all the rest of the stuff, uh, and you have a communal collective kind of thing, and so forth and so on. All this stuff is this new hybrid, which is attached to the, to the libertarian class analysis by Marxists. Okay, so um, the meantime, this whole analysis that, in, in, that in, in industrialism requires a free market continues on through the 19th century. Herbert Spencer was mentioned already here, and is one of the last people who really had this firmly. He called the, the two concepts of society the industrial society versus the military society. What he meant by the military society was essentially this statism, militarism, the old order. And the industrial society requires a uh, free market. Uh, this whole <clears throat> this whole analysis gets lost in the shuffle by uh, by the turn of the 20th century as laissez-faire begins to die out. Thinkers begin to die out. But the, of course, the reality, the actual reality of the situation, the free market requires uh, uh, industrialism requires a free market, still continues on. The reality is not affected by the fact that the theoreticians have died out. The uh, what happens incidentally to the socialists, to the Marxists, at all times the Marxists are always confronted with a crutch, which is part of their inner contradiction. On one hand, the Marxists claim that they're 
in favor of a revolutionary smashing the state of the bourgeois state apparatus. On the other hand, they claim they, they, they want to take over the state and run the, you know, have a, a, a big statism before the withering away of the state, which might be for, you know, somewhere over from hundreds of years. And so usually when the crunch comes and, and Marxists arrive somewhere near the seat of power, there's, there's a split off, and the left-wing Marxists still remain revolutionary, and the right-wing Marxists become something like, you know, Sidney Hook, uh, who was a right-wing Marxist. In other words, they become part of the state apparatus, they, they become what later became known as Browderites, so you achieve this socialism by more and more accretions of state power, and eventually you'll have this great socialist system. So you have this constant splitting off in, in, in the Marxian world. <coughs> well, <coughs> the, um, one of the things that happens is that statism begins to come in. Well, let me put it this way. One of the big problems with the fact, with this law of cause and effect, I, I believe there's a law of cause and effect, and we can analyze reality. And one of the things about the law of cause and effect is status measures and increasing statism will make the system unviable, will make it unworkable, will ruin it. The problem is, however, it takes time, and it's not, it's not one of these immediate things. You know, uh, when I take vitamin pills and I'm, I'm tired or something, I like to have the idea that when you take, you take this vitamin pill and suddenly you'll pep up, you know, it's like some instant, instant pill. <sighs> I'm just taking this vitamin B pill and I'm raring to go. Of course, it doesn't work that way. There's a time element involved in cause and effect. In the, in the social sphere, there's a big time element, big, big time lag. For one thing, laissez-faire, you know, virtual laissez-faire, relative laissez-faire, has built up in the United States and in Western Europe an enormous industrial machine, enormous capital investment. And so there's an enormous amount of play in the system. There's an enormous amount of looting, looting zone. Uh, which the state could fasten onto, and without visible deterioration for a long, long time. Uh, and when, you, when, you, when, you, when you get to the, <coughs> to the late 19th century um, thinkers, libertarian or quasi-libertarian thinkers, they are very pessimistic. They are gloomy as all get out, and with good reason. I mean, there might not be epistemological... <laughs> maybe they shouldn't have been epistemologically gloomy, but they certainly is, as all hell, historiographically gloomy, because they were at the beginning of this process. People like Spencer, Sumner, Pareto in Italy, uh, was essentially a libertarian, but extremely pessimistic one. They look around them and they see the state closing in for the kill. And Pareto writes letters. Pareto started off as, a, as an aggressive young libertarian. And, uh, and finally he sees that everybody's bad. Not, it's, not, it's, it's, essentially he was attacking the plutocracy, what was known then as plutocracy, the, the right wing, mercantilist, uh, big business statism, etc. And he thought that the labor unions were essentially his allies, because they were supposed to be against statism. And then, it, then he finds out the socialists are just as totalitarian, even more so than the businessmen. And he gives up. He, he doesn't see any hope for classical liberalism continuing. And then he, he does what one uh, political scientist called retire to Galapagos in the sort of spiritual sense. He just says, all hopeless. There will there'll always be a ruling class. And, uh, you know, that's it. Uh, this has been wrongly interpreted as him favoring a ruling class. He didn't. He just he's a libertarian who gave up. <coughs> uh, but there was some good reason for giving up, because... The poor guys who were living around 1900 would look ahead of them and saw, and those who were more far-seeing than the others, saw statism advancing and encroaching, and saw no, no hope of any counter counteraction because the, all the laissez-faire people were dying out. And you have the Ely stuff that we've been talking about, and the, you know, the, the Bismarckian influence and all the rest of it. All this stuff is growing. This is the big new thing, the big new fad. Um, and, of course, you have... A, Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution, you have socialism and so forth and so on. It looks like socialism is the way of the future. <coughs> um, if we could put up, I think it was Lincoln Steffen's famous remark of visited, a great progressive muckraker visited Russia and, and came back and he said, I've seen the future and it works. It famous Steff, Steffen's remark. Well, what, one of the things that happened and one of the reasons why I'm optimistic is this is now 70 years later after these after the poor, old, our poor old confreres uh, looking very gloomily at the future. And we, we've all seen a future, and it doesn't work. In other words, uh, just for us in the brilliant lines, the trouble with pragmatism is it doesn't work. <laughs> um, we've seen that all these things don't work, and this, and, the, uh, and this is becoming more and more acceleratedly, if that's the word, evident as in, this, in this current period. <clears throat> uh, for some reason, I find this a very optimistic thing, and for us doesn't, but at any rate, in other words, what's happening here is that all these all these trends which are taking place, all these all these measures, higher taxes, inflation, uh, the, the whole business, which uh, Keynesian measures and, and cartelist measures, all these things which could, could apparently be gotten away with because there's so much fat in the system, so much fat that had been developed by the uh, industrial system, by laissez-faire system, that you, it seems like you know, it's like the, it's like the, the the myth of the 
What's, what's that fable about the tower that you holding up the sky and keep chipping away at it and finally the whole thing collapses. And each chip looks as if it's completely unimportant. It doesn't really hurt the system. So that's, so now, but now we're getting to the point where the system is being hurt. It's, it's getting more and more obvious the system is, is being hurt. The system is collapsing. Uh, my mentor, Ludwig von Mises, called this in his book, Human Action, written in 1949, the exhaustion of the reserve fund. What he meant by that is you have this reserve fund that had been built up by by capitalism, by free market capitalism. This reserve fund is now being tapped, has been extracted more and more by, by socialist or status measures. And we're now getting to the point where the reserve fund is exhausted, and that means that the cause and effect will now be catching up the cause. In other words, the next chips, you know, chip away at the tower that holds up the sky, pretty soon the sky is going to start wobbling. Now the tower is going to wobble and the sky is going to start collapsing. Now this, uh, what this means is we're beginning to have a situation where the cause and effect chain is becoming, uh, becoming much, much more short range. In other words, if something happens, you can immediately see the bad effect because the reserve fund is exhausted. And this is very good, as far as I'm concerned, it's a very optimistic kind of thing. It means that the masses, who, or most people, who tend to be, don't tend to look at things in a rather long range viewpoint, because not really that interested for one thing. Now, you know, now see that the thing is evident. You, 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 I mean, like the price control thing, and one metaphor. Uh, and we, we had the first price freeze in 69, excuse me, August 71. And those of us who are free market economists were leaping up and down and shouting, saying, this thing can't work, and nobody else, nobody paying attention to us at all. The whole world, the whole country at least, was loved the price freeze. It was great, it was terrific. Businessmen loved it, labor leaders loved it, economists even sold out and loved it. And because the economists were supposed to be against them, every economist except Galbraith, before August 15, 71, said price controls are ridiculous, they can't work. As soon as August 15 comes, all the economists rush into private exception of Friedman and say, this is great, this is terrific, it's going to suffer, etc. So everybody loves it, and, the, and, it, and it's, it didn't work, but it, it, didn't, that, it, it didn't, not, didn't not work that quickly, because there was a lot of slack in the economy, it was, a, it was a, during a recession period, and so these shortages didn't show up that quickly. The, 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 price, the frozen price was not that much below the free market price. But this, things began to leak out a little bit, and fissures began to show in the system, and so Nixon goes over to phase two. Now he reimposes a price freeze in the current situation a couple of years later, where the economy is booming, there's no slack at all left, and immediately we, you know, meat shortages develop and, and, and margarine shortages and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. So the cause and effect <coughs> relationship, the length of, of time between initiating the evil cause and garnering the evil effect is becoming much, much shorter. Now he reimposes a price freeze in the current situation a couple of years later, where the economy is booming, there's no slack at all left, and immediately we, you know, meat shortages develop and and, and margarine shortages and stuff, stuff, stuff. So the cause and effect <coughs> relationship, the length of, of time between initiating the evil cause and garnering the evil effect, is becoming much, much shorter. So we have. So this, this is, uh, this is sort of, sort of like teaching kids, I guess. I'm not exactly uh, expert in kid teaching, but a kid, te teaching kids is supposed to be very important to show the cause and effect relationship very quickly. So you don't have to bother with a long chain of resulting, you know, consequences, etc., etc. Have the thing be dramatic, and, sh and short run, and uh, immediate. <clears throat> and this this uh, condition of immediacy is now becoming general throughout the system. Uh, let me try to go through some of these areas. Uh, what we're seeing in the United, <clears throat> United States certainly is what we can call a crisis of liberalism. It's, it's uh, well, a crisis of liberal dash conservatives. Uh, Liberalism, progressivism, state monopoly capital, whatever you want to call the system, uh, corporate liberalism, has been really running the system at least since the 30s, the 30s and, um, and I think we've shown also really in the wider sense since the progressive period. And the, the reserve fund is being exhausted. In other words, cause effect is now cashing up the cause. And all throughout the system, we see breakdowns and crises, which are becoming more and more aggravated. <coughs> uh, well, what are some of them? Well, they're almost all over the place. The, I mentioned before already the public school system, which in, only 30 years ago was absolutely beloved. I mean, really beloved. And you couldn't attack it at all. And now everybody's attacking it. It's generally accepted as something that the whole thing is just not working. It's a miserable, rotten mess. That's one area. Crime in the street, the whole, the whole urban question, urban decay, uh, is getting so evident that uh, one of the big uh, jokes for talk shows is, you know, there's New York and you can't walk down the streets in New York. A little exaggerated on the talk shows, but the, 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 the drift is clearly there. Uh, so the whole urban question, which is solely a, a function of government, I mean, government has been handling. If you, get, if you look at the crime on the streets question, every aspect of 
crime on the streets has been totally the responsibility of government all this time. Uh, the police are government, are government police, the streets are government streets, the courts are government courts, the police are the, and the, the prisons are government prisons. The whole thing is government, yet the whole thing is collapsing. Not yet, of course. Therefore, uh, the, uh, the air pollution question is a, even the, and water pollution is a question of pure government responsibility. The government courts have been deciding, the government's been owning the rivers all this time, and the government's been, the courts are deciding the air, the air pollution question, who could, who could dump water into the air and so forth. Uh, the, uh, and getting, and of course the regulatory commissions and all that stuff, all these things that we've been talking about all week, <coughs> It's getting more and more evident these things are collapsing. Liberals who used to love the ICC or the CAB now acknowledge, of course, these things are all terrible and they're, it's, uh, it's a melange of cartelization, etc. And the railroads are collapsing and, and all over the place. We have more and more, and, and especially, of course, the most governmentally affected, uh, regulated or controlled uh, areas, more and more of this kind of collapse. Uh, more broadly, we have the tax question. I, I really think, uh, maybe this is wishful thinking, but I really think that we politically reached a tax ceiling in this country. I mean, we've, gotten, we've gotten to the point where the government does not dare to put on an increase the income tax, for example. I mean, just it's, there's a tax rebellion in the United States which takes many different forms. Things like voting down school bonds, which used to be fantastically you know, outside, I mean, in the pale. You could, it's outside, outside the pale, pale vote against it. Um, and uh, in, in various areas of the public can, can vote directly, they, turn, they vote down the tax, tax kind of things. And uh, so the income tax, I think, is pretty well, at least looks like it's, it's pretty well reached the ceiling. The government cannot politically raise it. Property tax is on a severe attack uh, for, for the first time in many years. There's even talk of abolishing property tax or reducing it. Certainly, it can't, it can't increase it very much. Uh, the VAT is in stop of the past. That was very important because the, the value-added tax, which Nixon was first tinkering, he's tinkering, toying with the idea of value-added tax. It was a very sinister tax, basically because it was hidden. And nobody would know about it, and they, and they think that the reason why businessmen are charging, suddenly charging these increased prices is because of business greed. And it would have been very, very difficult to convince the public, no, no, it's because the VAT has been imposed each step of the way from the manufacturer to the processor, etc. So Nixon, Nixon tries the VAT, and this is during the Nixon honeymoon. This is before Watergate. And, uh, and there's a big hullabaloo arises in Congress, and, and, he, and he withdraws the whole plan. So we have, I think, a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty well political tax ceiling. Uh, okay, there's also the inflationary route, but inflationary route is now catching up, as I've been mentioning, as I've been saying this week. You can you can pump in the inflationary engine for a long time. Let me let me give you this little example about the German inflation. I think it's very relevant. <laughs> Oh yeah, social security tax. Yeah, social security tax, which starts off as a great bonanza for the guys who have become 65 in one year. Looks like you know this is, a, this is a fantastic giveaway. Now, of course, the young people are locked into it, and tax benefit and the, and the tax rates keep going up every year. So that this is <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to keep going up because the, the bonanza is only a very short run bonanza. The guys who look if you're 60, so-called social security insurance, if you're 64 in 1936 or whenever that thing passes, and in one year you reach to be 65, you get the full benefits. So obviously these guys, this. this this windfall group has now passed, passed out of the picture, and now the full weight of Social Security is beginning, beginning, beginning to be increasingly evident to the public. So the German inflation thing, what happens is, the first years of the German inflation, in other words, 1914 to 1922, or, or approximately that, the money supply keeps going up. Like that. The prices are going up less. They're going up, they're going up less. And why are they going up significantly less than the money supply? Because the, public, the German public the poor, deluded German public thinks that the inflation is purely a wartime phenomenon. It's because of war. As soon as the war is over, we'll get back to normal, we'll get back to the old price level. Uh, they don't get back to the old price level, but they keep thinking this for quite a while. Oh, the speak of normalcy after the war and all that stuff will get back to the old price level. And so they save up, they don't buy marching machines and all that, and they're waiting for prices to fall. Well, comes the, you know, and then they begin to realize as time goes on, the psyche of the public changes, they begin to realize that nothing's going to fall. And prices are going to keep going up, and then the thing changes. And as prices, as the money supply keeps going up, there's a crossover, and prices are going to rise faster than the money supply. And you get the situation where the boobs in the, in the German Reichsbank were issuing statements saying, "Don't worry about. It. We, we hear on all sides there's a money shortage because the people are clamoring about the fact that they haven't got enough money to buy the buy the goods, which are now 
being priced astronomically high. And the German government said, don't worry about it. Right spot. We have the printing presses working all night long. We're keeping night shifts to, to <laughs> pour enough money out of the public. And of course, this is going to spiral even more. But the point is that inflation, the point I want to make here is now is <clears throat> inflation is, very, is a great thing, seemingly great thing, in the early years of inflation. The early years of inflation, interest rates are low and prices aren't going up that much. And, uh, and it seems like a big boom period and so forth and so on. In the later years of the inflation, uh, retribution begins to catch up. In other words, the effect begins to catch up the cause. Prices start going up faster. Uh, something like exponentially at this point. Prices start going up faster. Interest rates start going up. You can't push them down. Wage rates begin to catch up. The price, uh, prices when they've been falling behind before, creating inflationary profits. And so the crunch comes and there's no way out. And as, the, as these effects occur, as the high interest rates occur, and the higher costs occur and the higher prices, the public begins to get very irritated, as you, of course, have seen. Of course, the first step is lashing out and saying, freeze everything. It but not only doesn't it work, it's becoming evident that it doesn't work. But something else has to happen. So we have, we see, I think, in all the end, we see all, of course, in the, uh, in, the, in the public school system and the racial integration attempts, etc., of course, an enormous amount of headaches and conflict. So we see all through the system increasing crises. Um, and... Uh, and these crises are systemic, they're, they're inherent in, in the status system, and they're getting more and more evident. See, I would analyze it as, being, as a fact catching up with the cause, that the fat has now been taken off, the reserve fund has been exhausted. And from now on, every, it's an accelerating effect, because every time we, uh, a new status measure comes in, we're going to get a new bang, bango kind of response out of it, or evil, bad response out of it. Uh, okay. So... So things are getting progressively worse, will continue to get worse because of the, of the status measures are now reaching their effect, as the effect as the fat is as accordion, accordionized, and we now have the, the, the effects coming out from the causes. Uh, now, the Mar getting back to the Marxists, and I, have, I've, I've, uh, I enjoy reading Marxist-Leninist literature. Of course, there is a certain, there's a, there's a point, you know, when you sort of get skipped with your eyebrows, uh, with the jargon and so forth. But, one of the reasons I enjoy Marxist-Leninist literature is the Marxist-Leninists, even, even though I disagree completely with their goals, uh, about the only group that has been talking about and thinking about social, social change for the last hundred years or so. In other words, they're the only radical group of any substance who've been spending a lot of time thinking about strategy, thinking about social change. And of course, this is what we're confronted with tonight. Is why should I be optimistic or why should Forrest be pessimistic? In other words, we're talking about analyses or theories or predictions of social change. <coughs> Um, and uh, I think the Marxists have been remarkably successful in social, in effecting social change, not in, not in the United States, of course, but in, if you look at the world picture, uh, and uh, especially considering the, the, the holes in the theory, holes in the doctrine. So I think it's important to, uh, to study the literature, to find out what they've been saying, how, what, how do they think. In other words, if, if libertarians have a radically different system than is now, is now in power, which we do, uh, and the Marxists have a radically different system from now in power. What have the Marxists been saying? How do they think social change can be affected? Well, one of the things they say is, uh, well, we'll see two, two particular things. One thing they say is, wait, there's, there's a ruling class. And of course, libertarians, in my view, believe there's a ruling class, but we have a different view. So we don't believe the capitalists rule the workers. Uh, and one of the problems, the reason, one of the reasons why the Marxists say we don't have revolution by the oppressed classes, by the subject classes who are the majority, is because the, the oppressed class suffers from what, is, what they call false consciousness. In other words, that, the, uh, that the, they, they, they think that they're really being benefited by the, by the king or whatever. So therefore, the task of the, of the... So how do they get to the true consciousness? How do they find out about reality? How do they find out they're being oppressed by the nobles or the king or the, the Marxian in terms of capitalists? Uh, the way they find out about it is by intellectuals telling them about it. That's one way. In other words, you need a cadre or a, or a, or a group of self-aware, dedicated, uh, uh, professional intellectuals uh, of some sort who are, who are dedicated to telling, enlightening the public, enlightening particularly the oppressed classes. There's no really need to enlighten the ruling class. I mean, they, they might be enlightened or not, but the, the point is to enlighten the oppressed classes so they'll do something about it. And uh, to give them the message and show them how they're being oppressed, etc. Uh, 
In this way, their blinkers are taken off and they'll be up there. They will become enlightened to their own subjection. And one of the problems of this, is, and the Marxists, the Marxists, of course, face the, face the fact pretty quickly, mostly the masses just aren't interested. You know, they don't give a damn uh, about all this stuff about the ruling class and the workers and the capitalists and so forth and so on. There's a lot of fretting going on among Marxists for these people. Here we are trying to help these, these SOBs, and they're not even interested. Uh, so the, the point then becomes, and the, the Marxists learn on a strategy, that there has to be a reason for them to get interested. After all, at least the, most of the public are not professional political theorists. They don't really care that much about the whole business. They're like they, 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 they're the, whatever the Russian or German the equivalent of, of uh, watching television, that sort of stuff, and going bowling. It's a major interest. There's really nothing wrong with that. There's no real reason why they should be great political theorists or be interested in political theory. The, uh, however, there's a problem that is that they're being oppressed and all the rest of them are being oppressed. And we like to enlighten them on this subject. The point, the point is, this kind of enlightenment, this kind of spread of enlightenment, so to speak, to the oppressed classes, uh, can, can really only take place, as the Marxists began to realize, if two conditions are met. Uh, conditions which really mean that their, attention's, their attention is caught. I mentioned, remember I mentioned before that you have to catch the attention of, of somebody to get them to learn something if he's not really interested. So uh, these conditions really amount to the masses or the oppressed classes or whatever getting interest, being forced in quotes to get interested in the, in the topic. Uh, for this, you need two conditions: what Marxists call objective conditions and subjective conditions. Peculiar terminology. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, I guess, Hegelian terminology. I'm going to argue Hegel. At any rate, the terminology is objective and subjective conditions. Uh, what, they, what the Marxists mean by objective conditions is the conditions have to be right. In other words, there have to be a lot of terrible, a lot of things happening, breakdowns in the system. What, what they call crises situations, either wars or defeat in a war or runaway inflation or depression or whatever. Uh, now this is an attention-getting device. In other words, a breakdown in the system is a big attention-getting device. People suddenly get interested in the, in the problem. During the 30s, a lot, of, a lot of everybody got interested in unemployment. Why is there unemployment? What's going on? What, why is there a business cycle? This, is, this doesn't mean there's any great theorizing emanating from the 30s. The point is, a mass of the public, for the first and last time in their lives, got interested in business cycle theory. So the point is, crisis situations <coughs> uh, create the objective conditions for the success of radical social change. Um, and what I'm trying to say here is that the objective conditions are increasingly being fulfilled in the United States and are going to be more and more going to be fulfilled as the effect is more and more going to catch up with the cause, as the as the as the the, the prophecies of Spencer, Brayo, et cetera, are going to be fulfilled, and more and more evidently so. As taxes get more and more crippling, as inflation gets more and more crippling, as the urban mess gets worse and worse, et cetera, et cetera, the whole business. Oh, oh, I should also add here foreign policy, of course, a special Lon Yapi. Uh, the Wilsonian foreign policy, collective security, and that, that whole business is obviously going down the drain. He, I mean, that clearly and patently has failed. The idea of fixing everybody up all over the world, going to corporate. So the whole liberal system, the whole corporate liberal system is in a state of aggravated collapse, and more and more evidently so to the, to the public. Okay, so the objective conditions for radical social change are, are being, not only being more and more fulfilled, and, more, and increasingly so in the last 10, 15 years or so, but this, this, these conditions will be more and more ripe as time goes on. In other words, the future is great for the <laughs> increasing presence of the objective conditions. <laughs> uh, what about the subjective conditions? A subject of the, what, what Marx meant, in, Marx has meaning in this peculiar term, subjective conditions, means essentially people to carry the message. In other words, you need the, the, the breakdown, and you need the people to carry the message. The people, of course, the cadre, or the, or the hardcore, or whatever it's, it's called, the, what the Lenin called the professional revolutionaries, is a, is a dramatic term. Um, the, uh, in other words, what, re what is really meant is a group of self-conscious, intellectuals who, who offer the alternative. Now here are, in other words, people will say, look, here, see the system is breaking down, right, right? And, and here's why it's broken down. We can show you why, how it all fits in, and why uh, we predicted this before, and we can show you our writings 20 years ago that predicted an inflation, and so forth and so on, the whole, the whole business. And uh, the theory then is that the, the, the public increasingly turns to these guys who have shown themselves to have predicted correctly, and have shown, them, and have, have shown an answer that makes sense to this problem which has been called forcibly to the attention of the masses by this breakdown in the system. Uh, well, if the, if the objective or conditions for the success of liberty are, are great and getting better, what about the subjective conditions? Well, here, uh, 
I'm not I'm not going to st stand here and say that libertarianism has become a mighty force in the land, but I think I think uh, certainly the rate of increase has been fantastic. And for those of us who are veterans in, in the movement, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, not only 20 years ago, but 10, five, well, five, seven something years ago, the number of libertarians in the Eastern Seaboard was just about you know could fit comfortably in my own small living room. Usually did. <laughs> Uh, you know, five, six, something like that. And he's, these are five, six brilliant theoreticians, but they ain't got no movement out there. <laughs> okay, of any sort. Uh, and then, uh, and then 1969, this is big, the famous big takeoff, I mean, famous within the movement, and I think like so. <laughs> the famous takeoff, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and young people are suddenly walking in the movement in great numbers. And, uh, and this is exponentially accelerating. I'm not saying this exponentially accelerating trend will, trend will continue, but all I can say is reporting is an historian at this point that from 1969 through 1973 has been an enormous rapid rate of increase in the number of libertarians. It's gotten to this point. You see, it's gotten to the point, as Marxist friend of mine, of course, are sneering at this whole thing. I haven't got any people there. Uh, we're fulfilling one of the conditions of the Marxists say. We're now fulfilling conditions where somebody writes an, a libertarian article of some merit, and, and some publication which, are, which I've barely heard of, and I haven't heard of this person. Now, this is a big this is a big thing for the ideological movement. In other words, up until a couple of years ago, I knew every libertarian in the country, and if somebody writes an article, this is J.R. Jones or something, I would know who this guy is, and et cetera, et cetera. Now people are popping up all over the place and I've never heard of them before, who are plugged into the whole thing. We don't need to be hashed over and educated and <laughs> brainwashed, et cetera. In other words, if somebody pop up, uh, all over, and this is true all over the country. So, uh, <clears throat> so I find this an exciting development. I'm not going to predict uh, victory on the basis of that, but certainly, uh, certainly uh, consistent with the idea that victory is uh, is a common. Uh, then we had uh, we had the different organizations. We started off as a, our only organization for several years was a campus-based organization, which is what the new left had encountered. The new left was never able to break out of the campus of the campus, even at its height. They were much more numerous than we are at this point, but they were never able to break out of the campus. Uh, somebody graduates from the campus, he's a big leader of SDS, and he's a senior. One year later, he's completely dropped out, he's off somewhere, and they, they found it impossible to mobilize to go to the next step and get an adult group. We, we now have a, a, some adult groups. Uh, the Libertarian Party, which started uh, uh, last, last March, uh, which I figured was a quasi joke. In the sense that uh, here we have here are 200 libertarians in the country and we're running a president, a presidential candidate. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? But it's been growing very rapidly uh, uh, in every state, even after the presidential election. So every I think every state now has a, a nest of libertarians. They're uh, they're pretty they're they're largely highly intelligent. They're active, dedicated, etc. And they're and they're uh, they're popping up everywhere and in different communities. All the we have a Buffalo chapter, for example. And, uh, well, uh, just started, etc., etc. Not only that, but our presidential candidate, a distinguished philosopher, uh, got an electoral vote 19, uh, last year. This is undoubtedly the cheapest electoral vote per dollar uh, in, in, in the history of the United States. And we, I mean, they had a campaign fund, I don't know, $500 or something like that. And you got an electoral vote for that. $500 per vote is pretty darn good. So, uh, so we have that as a, as a you know, as a, as a first, <laughs> as a groundwork. Um, and not only that, but the sort of the reception I get as a, as a veteran uh, in the movement, uh, there's an amazing change in the sort of reception I get from, from average intellectuals and professors, etc. Twenty years ago, these ideas were dismissed as being fascist, Neanderthal, uh, reactionary, paleolithic, etc., etc. And now the same sort of people, the same liberal intellectual types say, well, you know, that's pretty interesting, and I really believe most of that, and so forth. Now, whether they really believe most of that or not is another story, but they think they do, which is, I think, a great step forward. Uh, from, so from having the whole thing treated as a, as a reactionary and the end of all fascists, etc., they say, yeah, that's pretty good. How, does it, how do you think the courts will work and all that sort of stuff? You know? I mean, you get the sort of technical questions. And the general matrix of libertarian <coughs> uh, policy and programs seems to be, seems to be much, very much widely accepted. Uh, we've been getting a lot on radio and television. One of the friend of mine is also a libertarian in New York, and I were comparing notes over a couple of radio uh, interview programs. And we were both amused by the fact, instead of being attacked bitterly by guys being fascist and heartless and all that, uh, they say, yeah, you believe, what's your, what are your views on this? And you tell them what your views, crazy views on that. And they say, yeah, it's interesting, what's your views on that? And sort of, sort of, <laughs> sort of reverential questioning. I was on the, uh, I was on the John Wingate All Night program uh, a couple of weeks ago, and 
I like to my, my gun will be hassle, etc. And uh, and first, before the program starts, you know, while the commercial is on, he said, uh, and he's not, you know, he just, he's a regular talk show person, not, in no sense a libertarian activist of any sort. And first, before the thing is starting, he says, oh, by the way, what are your views on taxes? This is around April 15th, and he was, uh, his, his attention his attention has been forcibly called over the tax problem. He says, what are your views on taxes? I said, I'm against them. He says, all of them? I said, yes, all of them. He said, good. <laughs> <laughs> now there's somebody... I mean, there's somebody who's ready for the, for, the, for, the, for the march, you know, for the grand march. <laughs> and you find this all over the place. I mean, it's really uh, fantastic, uh, in my, my own experience, to find this sort of, <laughs> to find this sort of uh, reaction <laughs> among the public. So I think, um, I think the time is right. I think, um, <laughs> and, uh, and we, we can never, and then, you know, liber libertarians, I say, proliferating all over the place, the, recept the recept rec receptivity on the part of the public, uh, as Fantastically proof. <laughs> 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 he quit at five. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so the general cultural receptivity is much greater, and, and, the, and the media. That's true that the media has not been converted, obviously. But you get look, you begin to get this sort of thing. I mean, Forrest was asking this this morning. How do you get the media? Well, I mean, look, we've had a situation in the old days. I mean, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. The books, the sort of books we write, were published by the, you know, the Archon Press or something like that. You know, some, some either privately published, uh, out of hand, you know, handcrafted and no margin and that sort of thing, or else, uh, or else some very obscure uh, uh, you know, publisher didn't, just, didn't have any distribution facilities and so forth. And now we're getting published by Macmillan and Harper and Row and Harcourt Press and all that sort of stuff. Now it's true this could be a fad. On the other hand, the very fact that it's, even if it's a fad is a good thing. Since it's, uh, the establishment or the media consider us important enough or interesting enough or whatever to, to become a fad. <coughs> uh, the, uh, Macmillan, the, the August uh, publishing house of Macmillan and Company this year published, this season published no less than three libertarian books, which is I mean, it's fantastic. It's true they're not pushing some of them very hard, but uh, they, they published them, and there they are, and Harcourt, Harper and Rowe, a couple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, so all over the place we see this kind of thing happen. Even, even Penthouse magazine is now at work. Uh, article about the movement, uh, the libertarian movement, and a sympathetic article, since the guy who's writing is also libertarian. So these things are, so we're beginning to permeate the culture, so to speak. Now what, uh, what do we do afterward, how, what these, these precise path by which we ride the victory, I haven't yet uh, blocked out in my own mind. Obviously, uh, we haven't got that many people yet, so the, the thing has become, uh, you know, an important consideration. But, but I think that my basic view of, of strategy, my basic view of why I'm optimistic, I think should be pretty clear by this time. That the world. Oh, uh, excuse me. One big thing I left out. An important part of the story, which I shouldn't omit before I stop. Uh, while all this is going on in the United States, while the objective conditions are proliferating in the United States, and while the subjective conditions are proliferating at a le le lesser but a, but a more rapid rate, what's going on in the communist countries? I've already said Marxism has conquered half the world. What's going on there? Well, there are some of the most exciting developments in the 20th century, um, in my view, are developing there, which is, has gotten very little attention, a little bit of attention in the Western press, but very, very little relative to its importance. And the great hero, as far as I'm concerned, in this whole process um, is Marshall Tito. And Marshall Tito has gotten a little, little, little crotchety at this point. Uh, so I don't endorse his, his recent actions. But the point is, Marshall, here he is, Marshall Tito has, has ridden to power in 1948, excuse me, 1945, in World War II. He's ridden to power his, with his own army, his own guerrilla army, so he's not to be completely beholden to Stalin. But here you have a, an international communist system which Stalin was the guru and everybody listened, took orders from him. And naturally he apes the Russian system when he gets there and he puts on a full collectivized system, collectivizes everything, has the Communist Party run everything, the Politburo and the National Planning Board and everything else. There's a full Russian collectivist model, abolishing private enterprise, abolishing price system, etc. But what he sees, even though even though Yugoslavia is not really industrialized at this point, but even even with their small amount of industry, uh, what he sees is that the collectivi collectivized planning system does, wasn't working. And he saw this before anybody else in the Communist bloc. And he, didn't, he didn't see it, interestingly enough, because he read Mises or myself, <laughs> or whatever. He, he, he saw it because it wasn't working. The planning wasn't working. Everything was being, was being messed up. And so in one of the great, uh, one of the heroic uh, actions of, mo of modern times in the political economic sphere, Marshall Tito launches the process of desocialization. 
Now here's the, here's another possible. Uh, Forrest has been talking about, and I've been talking about this cumulative, this very depressing cumulative thing, where the state gets worse and worse because every time, the, as Mises has always pointed out, if you, if you if you have one intervention in the system, the government intervenes at one point, say in the farm price thing, this messes up the system. You're trying to solve a problem by intervening, but this messes up the system. You create two other problems. Then you're faced with a choice: either you repeal the whole thing and go back to square one, or else you have two other interventions to try to cure the two problems. But this creates two more problems, etc., etc., and you wind up with a full status system which doesn't work very well either. But the point is, this process can also be reversed. And we always knew in theory this could be reversed. We always knew in theory <coughs> that you could start with statism and have a step-by-step -step rolling back and freeing each sector. As, as a, and as the problem develops, you say, well, I guess we have to liberate this sec sector now in order to get that thing to work. Now, this, we always knew this in theory, but it seemed to be utopian, the idea this could actually happen in practice. Because historically, all we saw was the process working the other way at least in the modern world. But Marshall Tito launches the process of systematic step-by-step, -step, not, so not so gradual either, radical step-by-step destatization. -step, de de this is what they call it, by the way, de -state, de -state, de -state. Um, And in 1948, and by 1952, in just a few years, he established a market kind of socialism, which is a fantastic kind of breakthrough. Um, they still, yeah, they, and you had, uh, what you had was, first of all, they had a private sector. It was very strong. Agriculture was essentially private now in Yugoslavia. It has been since 48. Uh, agriculture is private. Uh, there's, a, there's a private sector of small businesses. In those days, hiring, I'd say, up to five people, something like that, which was private. And the so-called public sector was denationalized, and the workers in each plant own the, you know, own each, the workers own each plant, it's sort of like producers co-op co-ops. They don't officially own the plant, but they do in practice. Um, it's called social ownership. Interestingly enough, you see the Yugoslavs distinguish between social ownership, in contrast to the Russians, distinguish between, between social ownership and state ownership. And they're consciously anti-statist. Uh, one, one of the speeches that Tito made in the early days, he said, look, he says, Stalin keeps saying that, keeps talking about the withering of the way of the state. It's like, that was another phrase which, which comes in the way I originated. Stalin keeps talking about the uh, withering away of the state, but the state ain't withering away. The state's getting bigger and bigger in Russia. So it seems to be there's another way of withering away the state, and that's to start withering it. <laughs> and it was to start destatizing, getting the state off the backs of the public. So, uh, so Tito does this in a great leap in 1948-52. So by 52, we have this new system, uh, worker, worker ownership or worker uh, of the, the each socialized plant, so to speak, and then a free price system between the plants and a profit and loss test for each plant. Uh, and plowing back of profits, etc., etc. Also, the banking system gets decentralized, and the banks are essentially owned not by the government, but by the, but by the consumers, by the sort of consumer co-op banks uh, owned by the various firms. So we have a system that looks very much like, uh, you know, quasi-capitalism. As a matter of fact, even before '67, even this phase two of the, of the first big phase of uh, destatization, Yugoslavia was probably less socialist than France. That's a uh, uh, way of toss-up. But the interesting thing is, is, as they began to do this, as they began to free each sector, they found the problems began to el el be eliminated. And they found that here's a problem with steel or something, and they free, they have free pricing in the steel industry and profit and loss tests, and then the steel problems clear up. And so they got more and more excited about the process, and the, and the process began to accelerate. Finally, in 1967, there was a, a third phase, which went over to even more, uh, more free, much more free market thing in Yugoslavia, where you have uh, a price system that's completely freed, virtually. Profit and loss tests are even more stringent. A firm can now go bankrupt if they, if they lose money. Uh, <clears throat> and the state control of investment, which is the last big state control, and Mises has always said that if you want to know whether a country is socialist, look at who controls you know, basic investment. And before this, the state had taxed each, the, state, the Yugoslavian state had taxed each, corporate, uh, each firm something like 70% of its income and had taken all this money and decided on who, which, who will get what allocation of capital, which plant should be built where. In the reforms of 1967-68, the state income tax on, on plants was, was reduced from something like 70 percent to something like 20 percent, which is you know less than the United States. So you get so so now the investment has been freed also from the state from statism. You really have a, a very close to a free market system. One of one of the things that happens, one of the exciting things also is the ideology of the Yugoslav communists. I've read some of the com I, have, I don't read Serbo Serbo Croat, but I have. Uh, I read quite a bit of the you know, English translations of Yugoslav communist theoreticians. And what they're saying is, um, they're very excited about the idea of free market, and they're reading Friedman and Mises, etc. Uh, and they agree with it. 
And one of the things they, uh, they, and they try to apply the free market principles, uh, libertarian principles, systematically wherever they can find any kind of uh, anomaly or problem. Um, and, uh, and you have them sounding like, very, very much of this stuff sounds very much like uh, you know, right-wing republicanism in the United States, sort of like Barry Goldwater or Ronald Reagan. For example, you read the, you read the, uh, the communist economists. The economists have essentially been in the forefront, I'm happy to say, of this liberalization of free marketization. You read a, a, a typical Slovene or Croat. Slovene is a Croat, but his ethnic determinism coming in also. For various reasons, the Serbs have always been the SOBs in Yugoslavia and the statists. And the Slovenes and the Croats are the most industrialized, thriftiest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, most entrepreneurial. So, so the Slovenes and Croats have been on the forefront of this liberal uh, destatization. And uh, when you read a Slovene or Croat communist economist, I say he sounds like Barry Goldwater or Ronald Reagan, what he says is things like this. Why should we sh there shouldn't be any what they call political factories? We shouldn't have the state taxing us and building factories in Montenegro, an underdeveloped part of Yugoslavia. Because why should why should we, the thrifty entrepreneurial types in Slovenia or Croatia, why should we be taxed for those lazy Slavs down in Montenegro, or or you know, or both the Albanian part of uh, Yugoslavia? So the whole the whole analysis and the whole way of looking at things is, is individual as a free market and philosophic front. The uh, Yugoslavs are now talking in terms of that the individual should not have to sacrifice himself to the social welfare, the social benefit, which is a tremendous thing for Marxists, supposed Marxists, to say. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> and now they're talking about, well, the latest, the latest thrust, is what, uh, what they're talking about, oh, one of the things is that politically they're so decentralized for example, Slovenia, which is first, you know, a part of Yugoslavia, can make its own consular treaties with Austria, which are treaties which do not apply the rest of Yugoslavia, something like the Articles of Confederation. It's, it's, I mean, it's un almost unbelievable for a current modern country, you know, especially for a communist country. And there are things like um, foreign investment, they welcome foreign investment, they want to welcome American investment in Yugoslavia, and so forth and so on. There's, they're, they're trying to get back to, to a hard money for the dinar. And they want a freely convertible dinar. There's even talk about going over to a gold standard dinar eventually. Um, the, uh, and, and, and reporters who, who go, go to Belgrade, especially to Zagreb, which of course being Croat is better, is better than Belgrade. When they go into the Yugoslavia, they find a fantastic spirit, very different from the gray, dead spirit of the, in the Eastern, in Russia and Eastern Europe. And people, there's a lot of food in the shops, and then people are you know, happy and so forth and so on. So the whole kind of bourgeois spirit is now taken over Yugoslavia, as well as the, as well as the bourgeois economics. Uh, one of the things they're also trying to push, although they admit there's going to be some problem getting the old communist functionary to accept it, is to have a stock, a, a stock market. See, one of the things that, one of the, one of the things is this, is each, the workers own the plant. But they're facing this kind of a problem. Here you have 200 workers in the plant. But what happens if one worker retires? Why shouldn't he continue to have a vote? All right? And what happens, and why shouldn't he be able to, to pass his share on to, to his children? Of course, this means a stock market. It means, that it means each individual worker should have his pro rata share, and then he should be allowed to sell it or give it away. So they're talking in terms of the stock market, and, they and they're realizing, well, it's going to be kind of tough to get the old Communist Party hacks to accept it. So, so they, they, they propose to call it, and I get this, socialist people's capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they can't call it capitalism, obviously. That's the one thing that they're, they, I mean, they're ideologically barred from that. Outside of that, they're... they're Virtually going all the way. Now there, there has been some, uh, some setbacks since uh, life proceeds in a zigzag path, not a unilinear process. Some setbacks in the last uh, six months or a year or so. Tito has gotten very upset at what he calls anarcho -liberal liberalism among Yugoslav intellectuals and Yugoslav economy. He's trying to go back a little bit to the, you know, a little bit more statism. But it seems to me, it seems to me when Tito dies, which he will eventually, supposedly someday. Uh, <laughs> That the thing is going to bust open and they're going to go have a big march back onward to liberalism, uh, free marketization, destatization. Uh, I had an interesting experience along this line. But what happens is that Yugoslavia set the, the great beacon light for the rest of Eastern Europe. So that after a few years of seeing how the Yugoslav economy was developing and doing much better than the rest of Eastern Europe, Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and, uh, and uh, what else? Romania. Well, not Romania, but Bulgaria a little bit. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary began to shift over and be began to follow in the path blazed by Yugoslavia. But they had a lot more problems, obviously. One of the reasons, by the way, why Czechoslovakia was reinvaded by Russia, not only because of the democracy aspect, but because Czechoslovakia was going to make the full leap virtually to the Yugoslav position. 
And Stalin was, was seriously considering invading Yugoslavia when, when Tito broke with him. He didn't do it because, he was, because Tito threatened to fight forever on the hills. And it's the, you know, the great Yugoslav guerrilla tradition, so he didn't want to feel like he was trying to come back. But at any rate, it seems to me the process is, is more and more inevitable. What happens, what's happening is that one of the, the standard joke among economists that when you have a world economic or a European, you know, Anglo-American, European economic conference, the Western economists are talking about the glories of Keynesianism and planning, and the Eastern, and the communist economists are talking about the glories of the free market. Uh, I had an interesting experience when uh, I was teaching comparative economic systems, something, this is about 66, 67, during the height of the reform push. And, um, I was talking the whole term about the glories of the free market and the evils of socialism and state planning, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, to appease the kids and so forth, uh, we're getting a little restive at this point. I said, okay, we got another side of the picture. We're bringing this guy as a top Hungarian economic historian. I was, uh, I was uh, here on an exchange fellowship for a year. He'll give you his side of the story you know, from Hungary, communists, et cetera. He gets up there, and what does he do? He, he does this whole lecture denouncing the central planning of socialism and praising the free market. <laughs> which made our Maoist types very unhappy, <laughs> at least. Uh, Eugen Leubel, the communist, Czech communist economist who escaped from Czechoslovakia after the rollback, also came and lectured to us, and it was the same story. He was talking about the glories of freedom and free enterprise and whatever, and the evils of planning. It was the same sort of thing. But, so anyway, so what I'm saying here is that I think this, the same situation is, is happening in the communist countries. Interestingly enough, apparently not, with, not by not by a, a radical kind of one-shot change or revolution in any sense, but by a gradual, a cumulative destatization. Uh, in Russia, the process has gotten more publicity, but it's been less effective. The so-called Liebermanism is, is really a flash in the pan. It's been very, very slow compared to the... Compared to, I mean, Russia has had much, many more years to have frozen bureaucratic kind of setup, obviously, than, than in Yugoslavia or Poland. But the point is that the process... I think in Russia is, also, is going in the same direction. It's going to take a much longer time. And Eastern Europe is the real, is the real flowering ground for this sort of, this sort of process. Um, China is going to take, of course, a much longer time. China being the still fundamentalist, the communist, and, uh, and dedicated, etc. But I, as I said, I think I said a few days ago, uh, when this original generation of Chinese leaders die out, which presumably they will fairly soon, so they're all ready or something, um, it should be a loosening up of that, too, and back to what they call the capitalist road. Uh, so, okay, I think that sort of rounds out. I could go on and talk about the third world, etc., cetera, and the land question, but I think this is enough for the, tonight, uh, at least for the lecture. Uh, I, think, I think the reasons for optimism, to wrap it up, are that on the, we, we have this quantum leap, this, this great qualitative and quantitative leap in the, with the Industrial Revolution, with everybody from the communist rightward now being committed one way or the other to industrialism, to maintaining the industrial system. And with that, with the conditions to maintain and, 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 and flourish with industrialism, you have to have a free market. Uh, but this knowledge is now permeating the, the general public and even intellectuals with the breakdown of, of Western liberalism, with the breakdown of neo mercantilism and Western liberalism, increasingly accelerating, and with the breakdown of the socialist planning, which is even now being admitted by most socialists themselves. Um, there's a, there are very few even socialists now who will defend, even you know, the new left historians, uh, William Afton Williams and his group, uh, don't talk about socialism. They say, yeah, yeah, the state's bad, we have to have some kind of decentralization. That's a, that's a big step forward from what they used to say back in the 30s. So there's a general, a general revulsion against Leviathan state and against central planning and so forth. And, and so, so the whole communist apparatus, the whole communist kind of state planning is cracking up also. And so, uh, with this advance, with this acceleration of the objective conditions, with the processes of uh, libertarian word change accelerating, and with the growth of an active, uh, intelligent, dedicated, self-aware libertarian movement, uh, I see the future as being a noble one. Thank you.